Hi, everybody. We are back uh, with our segment on fractional reserve banking. In the last segment, we spent a little bit of time talking about the idea of the monetary base, which is actually the part of the money supply that the Fed controls directly when it sets monetary policy. It does not actually have uh, this omnipotent control over the money supply, as we had liked to describe when we were thinking about the quantity theory in the long run. Uh, so we're getting back into a little bit of the minutia related to how the Federal Reserve or Central Bank and the Fractional Reserve Banking System uh, actually operates. And the main feature that they control is the monetary base. Uh, what I wanted to take a look at in this next set of videos is what is known as the money creation process. And what we're going to see here is something kind of interesting in that uh, when the Fed, quote unquote, prints money, okay, when they increase the base, uh, the amount of money supply changes could actually be much larger than the amount of money that the Fed is actually uh, increasing the base by. Um, and this magnifying effect can become larger or smaller depending on the behavior of uh, individuals and of member banks. Uh, we're going to start off looking at uh, the Fed's balance sheet. Um, and hopefully, as you're maybe familiar with, uh, balance sheet is showing us here really a uh, balance of assets against the liabilities that are generated when the assets are held. And the Fed's assets are really two things. It holds government bonds and it makes loans to banks. And the liabilities uh, that the Fed um, has on its balance sheet uh, are both the currency in circulation as well as bank reserves. Okay, uh, so the, again, remember that the Fed controls the base. However, the public's decision to switch between deposits and currency and the bank's own reserve policy um, <clears throat> also have effects in how the money supply is being determined. So recall the way we had defined the money supply, we're using our M1 definition uh, as currency plus deposits. And in terms of uh, the base, okay, the base we had defined is the sum of currency and reserves. So what we're gonna do in this set of videos is think about the relationship between the base and the money supply. Okay, uh, it turns out that usually the money supply is larger than the base. Uh, you'll notice that the currency in circulation is the common component of the two. But since the money supply is usually larger, this means that in general, deposits in banks typically exceed reserves, uh, only a few exceptions to that historically. Um, in the recent crisis, this actually happened, and we'll uh, take a look at a case study a little bit later um, regarding the Great Recession and when this, uh, this excess reserve behavior uh, occurred. Um, and again, the main point of, uh, of this set of videos is to understand that the Fed does not have godlike control over the money supply. Uh, the Fed determines the base, but the behavior of banks and customers uh, in concert with the central bank, together they all determine the money supply. Uh, we're going to start off with a simple case of an economy with no banks. And if there are no banks, there are no deposits, and there are no reserves. So you'll see, oh, you're thinking, well, D is going to be zero and R is going to be zero. And you would be absolutely right to suggest that in that particular case, in an economy with no banks, the money supply and the base would be exactly the same thing. Okay, so if we had no banking system, um, there, there isn't a difference between these two concepts because there are no reserves and there are no deposits being made. Everything is just currency in circulation. Um, we want to start thinking about, though, uh, what happens if we do have banks and how does the money creation process work. So we're going to start off looking at Friendly Bank. Uh, Friendly Bank accepts checking deposits and it holds some of these funds as reserves uh, in case people want their money back at some point. And in the meantime, it uses the remainder of those funds to make loans. So this is the fraction in the fractional reserve banking term, that the bank only keeps a fraction of your money there and the rest of it they essentially give out to other people who may or may not pay them back. Um, the bank does run the risk that everybody shows up on the same day to get their money, in which case it may not have enough in reserves to pay everybody. Uh, if that happens, typically what the banks do is they'll reach out to other banks in the FDIC and uh, try to take out loans from them or uh, go to the Federal Reserve as a lender of last resort. 
Uh, just for the sake of numerical simplicity, let's suppose here that we started off with $1,000 in cash in the consumer's pocket. So the Fed created $1,000 in the base. And let's, for simplicity's sake, assume that people deposit $800 of that $1,000. Okay, and they're only keeping $200 in cash, only 200 bucks in cash. Uh, in this situation, the ratio of the currency held to the amount deposited, also known as the currency deposit ratio, is exactly 25%. Okay, now if we were to take a look at Friendly Bank's balance sheet at the end of the day, here's essentially what happened. You know, our consumers deposited 800 bucks. So now the bank owes them back that 800. That's in the liabilities column, but the bank also is holding on to $800 in reserves. Okay, at this point, we have $200 in currency, 800 in reserves, 800 in deposits, and note that the base and the money supply are both identical. They are both still equal to $1,000 here. Okay, and that's a consequence of reserves and deposits being the same at this stage in the day. Now, what does Friendly Bank do? How do they make money? Well, they make money, they make a profit by taking that uh, the, the reserves, which came from the deposits from the consumers, and they turn around and they loan some of that money out. Okay? And not all of it, there are some legal restrictions or minimum reserve requirements. Uh, but the bank does make loans. And we're going to define here the ratio of reserves to deposits held uh, as just literally the amount of reserves divided by the amount of checking deposits at the bank. And to keep things simple, uh, let's suppose the bank decides to hang on to $200 in reserves out of that $800 that was deposited, implying also a 25% reserve to deposit ratio. So two important ratios, we have currency to deposit and reserve to deposit. And for simplicity, I've set both of these in this example equal to 25%. Now, Tuesday rolls around and Friendly Bank makes loans. And then people, let's suppose, take the proceeds of loans in cash. So here's what happens. Okay. The bank still owes back $800 in deposits. Okay, now it's only holding $200 in reserves. And it has now loaned out another 600, meaning there's another $600 in cash that's been pumped out into the economy. Okay, so something strange happens at this point, and that is the following. Okay, we have 800 in currency in circulation. Remember, we were holding 200 originally. Consumers deposited eight, and then the bank lent out another six. Um, so the amount of reserves left are only 200 bucks amount of deposits is still $800. Okay, so the monetary base notice has not changed, but it looks like now that the money supply has actually gone up despite the fact that we started the day with only $1,000 in circulation. Okay, now let's continue this a little bit further. Maintaining those currency and reserve to deposit ratios, let's assume consumers keep 120 of that 600 bucks that was lent out and then they put the rest back into the bank, okay? Pushing reserves up again by 480 bucks. Okay. So notice deposits now have gone up by another uh, 480 from the original 800. And at this point, the amount of uh, money supply is up at 1600 still. The base is a thousand. Deposits have increased and reserves have also increased because we've now taken some of that currency that was loaned out and we put it back in the bank. You'll notice every time this happens, okay, every time this is going on, okay, we're getting some offsetting effects of reserves and deposits, okay? But it's happening in a way where the effects on currency and reserves are offsetting so the base isn't really changing at all but it looks like every time the money is loaned out, despite the currency and the reserves offsetting each other, the amount of deposits keeps going up. Now it doesn't go up by the same amount because every time the bank makes loans and people 
save some of that money as cash and put the rest back in the bank, the amount the bank has to loan out from that original $800 is getting smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. Okay, so the bank's making more loans. Okay, so let's suppose here now, um, the bank lends another $360 to people from the remaining cash that it took in. Okay, again, the base remains unchanged here, but now we just put another $360 back into circulation. Okay, every time money is put back into circulation from the loan process, note that the money supply down here is increasing. It's up to 1960 now. And you're like, well, is there a limit? Okay, to how much money can be created this way? And the answer is yes. Every time the ripple effect gets a little bit smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. Um, so there is a limiting quantity that we can actually calculate. And I'll show you how to do that in a minute. So the process is going on and on and on. Uh, note that this money creation process, it does not change the base. Again, because currency and reserves in each day, in each iteration, they change by offsetting amounts. And the money supply increases each time the bank is making new loans. So our general rule of thumb here is gonna be the following. Any type of policy that makes it easier for the banks to lend money is generally gonna cause the money supply to increase. Any policy that makes it more difficult for banks to lend money, for example, forcing them to hold more reserves, uh, this is gonna make the money supply tend to shrink in the other direction. Okay, so to summarize the money creation process here, we started out with $1,000 in currency, and that was a $1,000 money supply. Okay, consumers deposited 800 of that into the bank. Okay, so there's some offsetting effects between cash and deposits, so still the money supply is 1,000. Okay, but then the bank takes 600 of that 800 and it lent it out in cash, and that cash pushed the money supply up to 1,600 bucks another $600 added to it. And then the consumers took that $600, they kept some of it, but some of it they put back in the bank. Okay, so there's some what we call leakage in the cash. The consumers, um, they spend some of the money that they, did, that they uh, had initially. Okay, but there's also some leakage into reserves. Okay, every time the consumers are depositing funds, the bank isn't lending them all out. Okay, so these leakages here are the reason why at every term in the cycle, uh, the amount of money the bank has the ability to lend out is getting smaller and smaller and smaller. So this process doesn't end, it keeps going. And you'll notice each time it looks like the money supply was increasing um, at about 60% of its original value. And there's actually a geometric series you can compute to think about what that converges to. And there's a nice formula to let us actually do that on the next slide here. So uh, the money supply we define is currency and deposits and the base was currency and reserves. So if we were to divide the money supply by the base, we wind up with the following C plus D over C plus R. And if we were to divide the numerator and the denominator by D, so I'm gonna bring in one over D into the, each of the terms in the top and the bottom, okay, and then what that winds up giving us is the following. The C that we had up top becomes C over D. The D that we had up top just becomes one. And then the two terms in the bottom become C over D and R over D respectively. And the reason why I've transformed the variables this way is because C over D was that important currency to deposit ratio we defined earlier. And R over D is that important reserve to deposit ratio that we defined earlier. Recall that the, concert, the uh, currency to deposit ratio, this thing, C over D, it, that is determined by the behavior of consumers. This is determined by what fraction of their cash do they decide they want to deposit at X. R over D on the other hand, okay, their uh, reserves to deposit ratio, that's actually determined by the banks themselves. How much of their money do they wanna hang on to versus lend out, and there's a trade-off. Right, the more money I can lend out, the more profit I make on the interest. Okay, but 
the higher risk I run of not having everybody's money if everyone comes back to my bank to take out their deposits. There's a higher risk of a bank run there. Okay, so the key feature to see here is that the ratio of the money supply to the base, this is really determined not by anything that the Fed controls directly, but by these two behavioral variables, the currency to deposit ratio, which captures the behavior of consumers, and the reserve to deposit ratio, which captures the behavior of banks. Okay, so if we were to multiply that last line through by the base, then we wind up with the following relationship and that shows us really how the money supply is determined. The money supply is determined by three features. Okay, first and foremost, the currency to deposit ratio, that is determined, that is a behavioral variable determined by consumers. So the Fed doesn't really have control over that. The central bank also does not really have control over the reserve to deposit ratio. They can mandate a minimum, but it turns out most banks hold well in excess of the minimum amount. So the only thing that the Fed really controls, that the central bank really controls, is this last term of the base. Um, so this is really important. The terms in the blue and the red, those are out of the Fed's control. The base is in their control. So in order for them to really manipulate the money supply, they need to kind of lean against the wind in making sure if the blue and the red terms change in a way that they don't like, they can adjust the base accordingly to offset those changes. Okay, so this term uh, in front of the money supply, this whole term here, excluding the base, we're gonna refer to this whole thing as the money multiplier. And the money multiplier is just again the ratio of M to B. And the money multiplier is determined again by these two important ratios, the currency to deposit ratio and the reserve to deposit ratio. Okay, once we know the money multiplier, we can multiply that by the base and that will give us the value of the money supply. So just a real quick numerical example here. Okay, both of the ratios, currency to reserve and currency to deposit, were both 25%, so if we plug them in, we get a value of the money multiplier equal to 2.5. And what that means is for every dollar of money that we print or that we add to the base as the central bank, this actually scales the money supply up to $2.5, which is a very strange idea. You print $1, but somehow you get $2.5. That means when we started from that $1,000 base and consumers deposited 800 and then the banks lent out six and this process kept going on back and forth, the limit of the amount of money that can be created from that $1,000 base is exactly $2,500 total. Okay, so we print $1,000, money supply goes up by $2,500. Sounds great, sounds like we're getting something for free. But again, there's a trade, -off. always trade-offs involved. Um, so what actually affects the money supply? Well, the Fed can try to affect the money supply by changing the base. And the base was directly related to the money supply. Okay, if the base were to increase to $1,100, then again, at that multiplier of 2.5, the money supply increases to 2,750 bucks. Okay, an increase in either ratio typically reduces the money supply. Okay, so increasing the currency to deposit or the reserve to deposit ratio, they typically push the multiplier down uh, with the exception of one unusual case um, where R over D is bigger than one. But in general, an increase in either ratio reduces the multiplier and hence would reduce the money supply. And you can check in this numerical example, so try this yourself, that if we were to increase the currency to deposit ratio to 0.5, this actually causes the money multiplier to fall, even if the Fed doesn't do anything, even if the central bank does nothing. So if the central bank is worried about controlling the money supply, it would need to, for example, expand the base in order to respond to a reduction in the multiplier, to offset that reduction in the multiplier. Um, so this video, uh, again, was intended to introduce the concept of the money multiplier. And to see that the money supply is really determined by three things working together. There's the Fed setting the base. There's consumers in the banking sector deciding how much currency to deposit. They choose C over D and the banks themselves determine R over D. So the Fed actually has a very limited control over the money supply 
in that it can use the base to try to offset changes in the multiplier, uh, but it does not control the multiplier directly. Uh, stay tuned for a little bit more on fractional reserve banking. Have a good one.